Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our uh, webinar series. Oh, uh, I still don't hear anyone. Does, do other people hear someone else, though? Uh, I think uh, other people can hear me, but... Uh, Uh, Kimberly, can you hear me? <laughs> um, uh, okay, so uh, we can start again. Uh, sorry for our technical problems. Uh, welcome to our uh, webinar series. Uh, today we have a pop jam seminar and we have a special guest, Kimberly Gilbert and uh, she will present drivers of genetic diversity in regions of low recombination. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, you can start, Kimberly. <laughs> okay, I'll start then. Thank you for, I guess, an introduction that I might not have heard, but no worries, it should work anyway. Um, so I'm just gonna close this chat, I think, to see, oops. A bit better. Um, there we go. Okay. So thank you guys for the invitation to talk to you today. I hope this um, is a useful seminar. Um, so I'll talk about work I did in a previous postdoc of mine, but I'm currently a postdoc at University of Lausanne. But this is work I did at the University of Bern in Switzerland um, with several co-authors with uh, Dr. Fanny Pouillet, Stefan Peichel, and Laurent Excoffier. And so it's on the topic of uh, drivers of uh, genetic diversity in regions of low recombination. Um, and so to start with, I guess, the general background of why we should care about genetic diversity, um, I think most of us probably know that evolution needs diversity upon which to act. So it's uh, really essential for any evolutionary change to happen. And we generally have this idea that more diversity is better because this allows uh, more potential for adaptation to novel environments or changing environments. It can prevent inbreeding depression. And this is also important for species conservation to allow um, better long-term survival into the future. Um, and so we, we try to understand as evolutionary biologists or as population geneticists, what generates genetic diversity, um, both whether this is just uh, across the genome or if this is uh, across individuals or populations or species. Um, and so this is a, a major overarching question in, in evolution. Um, and so we want to know in a large part whether this is due to natural selection or genetic drift to um, disparate processes that can act um, in very different ways from each other. Um, and so uh, many, many years ago, um, I don't think the year is on this paper actually right now. Um, it was originally thought that um, once people developed the ability to see genetic markers, um, uh, that there was so much diversity observed in the genome that meant much of it must have been due to neutral processes, so genetic drift. And so this, this idea stuck around for many years in the, in the literature, um, primarily initially um, thought of by Moto Kimura, but also uh, Tomoka Ota and others um, who observed um, there's so much diversity that it must uh, be due to neutral processes. It can't all be due to selection. Um, and so they proposed this neutral theory. And this was an idea then at the time that genetic drift must be a major process determining um, uh, diversity in different uh, populations or individuals in the genome. Uh, but then later, as, as time went on, we got better uh, improved abilities to um, sequence genomes to get better genomic data. And we could um, start to see results such as this paper that there's indications that there is pervasive natural selection across some genomes actually. So this was an example in Drosophila and then there were uh, papers that followed after this as we got more and more data that, oh, maybe selection is actually, natural selection is the major thing driving diversity. Um, and maybe there is no importance of this neutral theory that we saw before based on limited data. Um, but then uh, we still continue to learn more and things got more and more complicated. Um, so more recent papers, uh, notably by the Charlesworths found um, a lot of things related to both neutral and selective processes and how there are lots of things that result due to hitchhiking, so linkage between different sites in the genome that may be uh, neutrally evolving or 
uh, evolving due to selection, but maybe leaving a signature of one or the other because they're nearby physically in the genome. Um, and most recently, uh, two papers came out, I guess, last year and the year before. Um, uh, the first one here, the neutral theory in light of natural selection by Andrew Kern and Matthew Hahn, where they actually say um, that they can firmly reject the universality of the neutral theory and that we really think selection is a major thing. And then there were other uh, notable authors who responded saying, well, there are actually foundational ideas presented um, originally in this neutral theory and it's not dead. It's still correct and useful for biology. So this is just sort of a broad background of this debate is still going on today. It's been going on for many decades and we're still trying to understand when natural selection is important, when genetic drift is important and what's generating diversity uh, in, in, in biology. Um, and so this work is one small little corner of how we can generate diversity um, in genomes. And so whether it's due to natural selection or genetic drift um, or other complicated processes that could interact with these, such as at the population level, we could have different demographic histories or population structure or different population sizes that determine how diversity changes um, or at the molecular level, which is what I'll go into talk about a bit more now with um, genomic hitchhiking and linkage. Um, and I guess I actually should have left the chat open in case there's questions. Um, uh, now I don't really see how to get it back. Anyway, maybe it pops up if there's a question, I hope. Um, so, okay, so if we look at genetic diversity across the genome, um, here's an example from three different species of poplar across the different chromosomes in this tree species. And we can see even at a genomic level, diversity is changing uh, super variably across chromosomes uh, and within chromosomes. And uh, also differing across species. And a lot of this has to do with recombination. Um, and there's this general uh, uh, observation that has been made of how recombination is related to genomic diversity. Um, and generally we find that lower diversity exists when there is lower recombination. So all of these plots are from different papers where we have recombination rate on the x-axis and different measures of diversity, genomic diversity on the y-axis. And so all of these you can see if we fit a line are generally showing this trend where there's a decrease from right to left. So with lower recombination, lower diversity. And this is across many different species, Drosophila, humans, birds, plants. Uh, there, there are some examples where we don't see this, this decrease um, in diversity as recombination reduces, but mainly it's observed in a lot of different organisms. Um, and that was uh, something uh, that is due to two potential different hypotheses or potentially both hypotheses at the same time. Um, and the first here that I'll go, go through is what we call a selective sweep, which leads to genomic hitchhiking. So this reduces diversity around positively selected sites, meaning uh, beneficial mutations that might arise in the genome. And then the second hypothesis is that diversity would reduce with lower recombination due to background selection, which I'll sometimes abbreviate as BGS throughout the talk, which is reducing diversity around negatively selected sites. And so to explain these a bit better, um, I have a bit of a schematic. Um, so all of these are types of linked selection. So in this case, we have all of these. So this, so if this is a, a diploid chromosome. We have two chromosomes for an individual. Um, we have neutral sites shown by these circles. They're just different sites by the color. And we have one little diamond site here, which is a beneficial mutation. So this is good for the organism. It improves fitness. So this will Im increase um, due to selection in the population, just this selected site will be uh, favored. And so if that happens and there's very little recombination across the genome, we won't really get um, anything breaking apart this, this one chromosome here, what I'll call this one haplotype. Um, and so if we look at what that, um, what will happen after selection, we'll get an increase in this yellow beneficial site and also everything that it's linked to. So that means we lose a lot of diversity um, because we're increasing this yellow one and everything that's nearby because recombination is not breaking it apart. And so this is why a selective sweep um, uh, in this linked selection scenario can lead to a reduction in diversity as recombination is lower. Um, I'll turn it, uh, yeah, and so if we look at um, a signal across, across a whole genome for many individuals, this is what a classic selective sweep would look like, where before we have many different haplotypes, one beneficial mutation and diversity might be equal across the whole genome. And then afterward, we get um, this one site selected for everywhere. So this red dot is now in every haplotype and diversity is hugely reduced right exactly where that sweep has happened. And as we get further away from that site, there is some recombination that has gone on. So then diversity um, is increasing as we move further away in the genome. There's less linkage as we go further away. 
Um, okay, so that's the classic selective sweep or the beneficial side of this um, impact of linked selection. Uh, we can also have what I called background selection before. So this is similar scenario, except now this mutation shown by the yellow star is deleterious. So it's bad for fitness and selection will remove it from the population. And so again, in this case, if we don't have much recombination going on, when this yellow star is removed, we're also gonna remove things linked to that yellow star, that deleterious site. Um, and so in that case, we end up with this other haplotype that is not removed. So we lose diversity again. This is again, a reduction in diversity because there's low recombination um, and everything, every individual now after selection has both, uh, both green circles, both pink circles and these blue teal circles. Um, and so that's background selection, kind of the other side of the coin of positive and negative selection in this linked selection scenario. If we look at what the diversity would uh, exist like here, um, it looks slightly different. And so this is because generally there's this idea that um, deleterious mutations are probably entering the genome at uh, many points in time. Um, it's much easier to break something than it is to fix something. So deleterious mutations, we assume happen more than beneficial ones. So we have many of these deleterious black dots across these different haplotypes. They're being removed by selection. Um, and therefore we get a reduction in diversity around the sites where it's been removed, but they're not always removed. So there are still some deleterious mutations left after because more enter as well. Um, so that's the difference between what these two patterns look like. Um, but then there's uh, one more scenario, which is the, um, the main focus of this talk. And that's what we call, um, ah, well, I'll tell you what it's called in just a moment, but that uh, is something we started to think about because of a previous paper that came out of the lab I was working in um, by Fanny Pouye and several co-authors um, where, so this is the title of the paper, it's background selection and bias gene conversion affect more than 95% of the human genome and bias demographic inferences. So the point of this paper was actually an aside, they were interested in uh, which, uh, which sites in the genome are neutral and are at this high recombination end of a spectrum if we're looking across recombination rate for some measure of neutral diversity. Um, I'll explain what this is in a minute, but basically they saw that diversity is greatest in areas of high recombination. So those are sites that we can use safely to say that they're neutral. But when they made this figure, they found uh, an interesting sort of artifact at the lower left here in this lower recombination rate region. Um, and this was not really expected. If you remember the observations I was telling you before, in many organisms, we just have this increasingly downward trend of lower recombination equals lower diversity. Um, so that this uh, right part of the graph matches our expectations. But then there was this unexplained uptick at the left at the lowest recombination rate. And so um, it was pointed out to us that this might be a process that's called associative overdominance. Um, so this is something that has been known for many years, this associative overdominance or AOD for short. Um, it's been studied for decades as well, but it hasn't gotten much attention. Um, I think people just didn't think it was really that important of a process. But when we saw this observation, someone's like, oh, well, maybe we should think about this a bit more. Maybe this is an important driver of diversity in lower combination regions. And so the difference here with associative overdominance is that um, we have a deleterious mutation again, shown by this star, but it's now recessive. Um, and so what that means is it's not uh, visible to selection or it's not affecting the phenotype unless it's homozygous, unless it's occurring in both chromosomes of an individual. And so in this case, if it's heterozygous, so it's only on one of the chromosomes, it's not seen at all by selection. So even if it was deleterious when homozygous, it doesn't affect fitness at all while heterozygous. And so what that does is if there's lower combination not breaking apart um, this region of the genome, selection's not going to see this until it's homozygous, so it will persist as a heterozygote in the population. Um, and after selection, we can get something like this, where we maintain a lot of diversity because we don't recombine away from this site, and we don't let this site become a homozygote. And so you can see we've maintained um, a lot of heterozygosity across um, this, or this, uh, this imaginary organism. Um, and if you think about that idea, again, that many deleterious mutations happen all the time, um, we could eventually get something that looks like this, where we have many, many heterozygous deleterious recessive mutations across a genome, and also many neutral ones. So this is why we could get this increase in diversity if we have associative overdominance when there are these recessive deleterious mutations and when there's low recombination. Um, okay, so, so that's what we wanted to see. And so this, I sort of made a, 
a diagram that tried to match these other ones that are from a textbook, but this one is not really legitimate, but uh, it would basically show an increase of diversity in a region where we have associative overdominance occurring. Um, unlike the other two processes that are both decreasing diversity and low recombination. Um, so the, the major question in this project was, can associative overdominance or AOD increase diversity in lower combination regions? Is it actually an important process that we should consider in the wider view of evolution and what is changing genomic diversity? Um, and so, so I'm a theoretical biologist for the most part, though I do some empirical work. A lot of my work is done in simulations. And so this is using a forward time simulator called SLIM. It's a really great program. If anyone is interested in learning more about it, I'm happy to discuss. It's a really good resource. It's quite easy to get, um, get going and to use to generate a lot of data that could be of interest. Um, and so these were quite simplistic simulations so that we could get an understanding um, of what exactly is going on in these different processes. So we have a simulation of only one single population. It's not changing in size over time and has 10,000 diploid individuals, um, n equals 10,000. And then in the simulation world, we can just tell, what, tell it what type of mutations we want to occur. So I only let neutral mutations occur and deleterious mutations occur. And then I vary in these simulations for the deleterious mutations, how strong they are. So how deleterious or how severe they might be. So this is the strength of selection or what selection coefficient they have, this value S. Um, it's not, I think I won't go through these results, but we also checked um, whether uh, if you allow more or fewer mutations, what, what impact this had on diversity. So this would be basically if there's like a higher or lower uh, mutation rate or what proportion of mutations for deleterious sites. But don't worry too much about that one. The other important thing we varied, which is key to testing this idea of associative overdominance is recombination rate. Um, and as well, uh, which is super important here is the dominance parameter, so H. And this determines how recessive a mutation is. So is it um, exposed to selection as a heterozygote or only as a homozygote or somewhere in the middle. Um, okay, and then, yeah, so uh, it, for anyone who is interested in some very specific parameters, we had a, this was our per base pair mutation rate. Each individual had six different chromosomes of length seven and a half megabase pairs. And each chromosome actually was just allowed one recombination rate in its entirety so we could really understand what was going on. So again, this is not reflecting real biology, but it's letting us understand how these processes are acting. Um, and that recombination rate was varying from either zero for one whole chromosome up to 10 centimorgans per megabase pair on uh, the sixth chromosome, for example. Um, and each simulation for the deleterious mutations that did enter uh, the population or did occur in individuals, we varied how uh, severe they were. So we had really weak ones this very uh, small S value or this also very small NS value. So this is the strength of selection and this is a selection coefficient. Those are equivalent. Um, this is just multiplying population size. So these are really weak mutations in this dark red, ones of intermediate strength in this orangey yellow and super, super strongly deleterious ones in this blue. Um, okay, so, so jumping into the results then, um, what we saw in our sort of control scenario where we have fully additive mutations, so H is a half, means mutations are seen by selection when they're heterozygous, um, we get th this pattern. So we're looking at synonymous pi, this is um, nucleotide diversity on the y-axis, so it's basically heterozygosity for neutral sites only, and we have recombination rate on the x-axis. So on the very right here, recombination rate is really high, um, and as we go left, so if we look at just our weak mutations, this dark red, this is a flat line for the most part. It's pretty much a flat line. If you looked at all the simulations, you can average that out and get um, this thick line that's drawn here. And that's what we would expect to happen for really weak mutations. They're so weak that it doesn't really matter if they are expressed in an individual. Selection lets them exist a bit because they're not really gonna kill off anyone. So we don't see any difference in recombination rate for really weak mutations for levels of diversity. It's the same pattern for really strong mutations. So this blue line, it's also very flat, but this is for another reason, the opposite reason that these mutations are so, so bad that as soon as any one of them occurs, it's immediately removed. So it's not going to exist in the population. So in that case, again, diversity at neutral sites near those mutations are not impacted by recombination rate. This is a flat line. The interesting one that, again, is what we would expect to happen is for these intermediate mutations. They're pretty bad if they occur. And so as recombination rate goes down, anything linked to these sites, selection is acting against them to remove them from the population. And so as recombination is reduced, 
um, we're getting this process of background selection occurring. So it's removing di neutral diversity around those intermediate level deleterious sites. And so this yellow line goes down all the way to the left, which is exactly um, what has been shown in previous work. So just a reminder um, of what that result of background selection looks like. Um, yeah, so this, this matches expectations from a paper in 95 by Hudson and Kaplan, as well as by Nordberg et al. in 1996. Um, and so I just showed you the same plot for neutral uh, synonymous diversity um, pi s. There's also this measure uh, DAF, or what uh, if we do per site, it's DAF sub i, so DAFI. Um, this was what was originally looked at in the paper that motivated this project in humans, where we saw that decrease, but then this unexpected uptick in lower combination. That, uh, anyway, the main thing here is DAFI is another measure of neutral diversity. And importantly, here we get the same qualitative pattern. Um, the blue and red lines are both pretty much flat, and background selection is largely reducing this yellow line. So we're getting a reduction in diversity in regions of low recombination. Under fully additive mutations, exactly what we would expect with background selection. So background selection is, um, is driving this change. I hope you guys hear me okay. I'm getting a network unstable message, but I'll keep going. Um, unless, I don't know if I can... Mm, I don't know how to open the chat again. <laughs> let's see. Uh, let's see what happens. <laughs> um, okay, and so I'll show you a bit more detail. These are the same exact results we just saw, except now I've added a few more cases of selection between those extremes of strong, intermediate, and weak. And so basically, again, we have flat lines for the really strong and really weak. And for the intermediate ones, we also get some intermediate patterns for ones that are uh, between those values, this red and uh, light blue line. Um, and so this is all really great. This is perfect. We understood what was happening. Background selection acts most strongly on intermediate level um, deleterious mutations when they're uh, fully additive. It, um, yeah, so to sum that up, diversity is reduced due to background selection with additive mutations. Um, but then to get to what we're trying to understand, this associative overdominance, we needed recessive mutations. And it instantly gets much more complicated when we have recessive mutations. So again, these are not seen unless they're in the homozygous state. Um, we're doing fully recessive H is equal to a zero. Um, and now we're looking again at this synonymous nucleotide diversity and this derived allele frequency. Um, if we just look on the left right now, this is an entirely different pattern than we just saw for the additive case. So if we have fully neutral mutations, so that's actually the gray line um, with no deleterious mutations at all, it's flat. So that's good. That means our simulations are working like we expect. If we add weakly deleterious mutations, this dark red, um, we actually see an increase now in areas of really low recombination. And we see this increase for every single case except for this dark blue. Um, all of these are having a really strong increase in diversity in low recombination. And this is exactly what AOD would lead to, this increase in diversity in low recombination regions. Though AOD does not seem to be affecting this dark blue line. And I'll come back to this later, but basically these, these mutations are too, too strongly deleterious to... Um, uh, to, to, to exist so well in a heterozygote state. So once they are existing at all, they do show up sometimes as homozygotes and selection can remove them. So these ones are still uh, uh, affected by background selection a bit. Um, the interesting thing we saw here is that instead of showing the same result from a derived allele frequency, so from this other measure of neutral diversity, we see some different qualitative patterns. So now several of these lines are going down as if it was only background selection and some of them are going up. So again, this really weak line this weakly deleterious mutation line in dark red is still going up. And so this confused us for a while, and I hope this will become clear as I go through more results. But basically, um, uh, if we look at those lines that are going down in the right, but not, but, but going up in the left, so namely this really light blue line does an entirely different pattern. Um, it's the way that these two measures are looking at diversity. So it's something that's important to note how you measure um, anything, of course, is important. How you measure diversity in a genome, uh, you have to keep in mind what sort of thing it's actually measuring. Um, and so basically, this derived allele frequency is measuring uh, for any locus that has uh, polymorphism, what, how, how heterozygous is it? Or what is the frequency of the, the novel heterozygote mutation? And so in this case, we could have many rare heterozygotes, um, but because there are still many of them, uh, this synonymous diversity is picking up on the fact there are many heterozygotes, but here we're picking up on the fact these are rare in terms of, um, in terms of what frequency they're segregating in the population. So there's many, many sites, 
but each of them is really rare in the population. So maybe only one individual has this site and one has that, but across all individuals, there's a lot of sites. So that explains the difference we were seeing here. Uh, but this just took us a while to figure out and we were a bit puzzled by the results. Um, uh, but to sum that up, so we do see that AOD can increase diversity with recessive mutations. A lot of those lines were going up when we look at um, synonymous pi. Um, but that this really, really strongly depends on the strength of selection, and that's really driving when this process should occur. Um, and so one of my co-authors, Stefan Peichel, um, developed a model to help us understand this even better. So this is a two-locus model um, to understand when AOD should increase diversity in a population. And so basically we have one locus, this A locus. Um, little a is our wild type mutation and big A is our recessive deleterious mutation. Um, and we have a second locus, a two locus model, this B locus where little b is our wild type and big B is our, again, another recessive deleterious mutation. Um, and so if we look at, uh, again, the recessive, so if we look at either the little b, little b or little b, big b um, haplotype, or genotype, um, we see that fitness there is uh, one whenever we also have either the homozygote wild type for A or the heterozygote wild type for A. Um, so this square, these are all great genotypes to B or haplotypes when you talk about the combination of the genotypes because your fitness is not impacted by these deleterious mutations when they're in the heterozygous state because they're recessive. But as soon as we get a homozygous deleterious mutation, either the big B, big B, or the big A, big A, we have a, a reduction in fitness. So that's whatever this selection coefficient is. So one minus S1 for A, one minus S2 for B. Or if you have both of them homozygous, you're especially doing pretty bad. So this one is a really unfit um, haplotype to B. Um, and so if you think again about this scenario I mentioned at the beginning that generally deleterious mutations should always be entering the population at random. Um, we have some deleterious mutation rate that is just a constant influx of mutations. Eventually, because the heterozygote is okay, you can have one big B or one big A, those mutations will exist in the population. And eventually we might reach the point where there is no little a, little a left. Every individual is at least a heterozygous for one of these mutations. And so in that case, we're going to lose this column and this row, and we're gonna be left with everyone having at least a heterozygous mutation at one of these sites. And so in that case, now there's only one haplotype that is the most fit. This one um, value of fitness is if you're the double headers, like little b, big b, little a, little, little a, big a. And then everyone else is going to have a homozygous deleterious mutation and they're going to be worse in fitness. And so in this case, we're gonna select for the headers, the double headers, I got, and that's gonna make a lot more diversity in the population. Than, than there would be otherwise. And this is exactly this process of AOD. We're increasing heterozygosity because that's the most fit um, way to be alive in this scenario where we have deleterious mutations that are recessive entering the population. Um, and yeah, this is a bit of a schematic to help understand this. So um, basically I think it's easier to look at um, the bottom figure here, but if you have, if you were only looking at this A locus, um, it would be great to be over here where you're the most fit, but this is again the little a, little a that we've lost. So the fittest is now in the middle of this orange line. And if we look at the B line, again, we've lost our little b, little b, which would be over here. So that's B1, B1 in this figure. Um, so it's best to be at this green line. And so combined together, when we have both of these loci with these sites in a single organism, that makes this upper um, pointy peak, or I guess a triangle without a bottom, where it's really best to be the heterozygote um, individual. Or again, in this case, we just have um, this forced heterozygosity that's maintained in the population to be fit. Um, okay, uh, and so, so a way we could look at the results of this model is to see, uh, given a certain frequency of our wild type haplotype, the wild type being again these little a, little a's, or little b, little b, um, and our strength of selection, our selection coefficient where um, a really small value is weaker negative selection and a larger value is stronger negative selection, we can see when we expect AOD to occur. Um, and so if we have a zero frequency of our wild type haplotype, that's when we have this scenario that we've lost all the little a, little a combinations or little b, little b combinations. Everyone's at least heterozygote. And so that's when AOD is strongest in this blue area. And we see that it's um, becoming less and less strong as we get out here. And so the way to understand this is, um, uh, well, here, of course, yeah, we have the fittest non-mutant haplotype um, is lost. 
And so we're maintaining heterozygosity. So this is super strong associative overdominance. Um, we're having a lot of heterozygotes maintaining higher fitness than um, allowing these recessive mutation, these recessive deleterious mutations to be expressed as homozygotes. Um, but as we get uh, to stronger selection, it's so strong that when it does appear occasionally as a, a homozygote, there's enough that selection can remove it. Um, and therefore we don't really get such strong associative overdominance over here. So that's why this uh, wild type haplotype frequency is getting closer to one, it's becoming more white. Um, and in this area, so we're trading off with our combination rate here. And so as our combination rate gets larger or there's more of a combination happening all the time, this is preventing the loss of the fittest haplotype because our combination can instantly break apart two combinations um, and let them segregate onto different backgrounds that they might not have otherwise been able to. But as recombination goes down, as we move uh, from the top to the bottom here, um, uh, we see that it, it's not as good at, at preventing the loss of this wild type haplotype. So that's why, um, ah, sorry, uh, in, in it, because it's trading off with really weak mutations, um, we can even have uh, no AOD happening because there's such weak mutations that it doesn't matter that recombination rate is really slow. Um, but basically this is showing how the trade-off between recombination rate, selection coefficient, and when we expect AOD to happen is in this dark blue area. These circles here are showing uh, individual-based simulations that match to this model. So the color, um, where the colors are the same um, means the model matched the simulations very well. So that was reassuring to see. Um, yeah, so this is the realm in which we expect um, AOD to lead to an increase in diversity. Um, so this is intermediate selection coefficients because the really weak ones here, it's really only a small area, but we have this huge blue area for intermediate S and for lower recombination rates. So closer to the bottom half of this graph. Um, and so that's cool. That So that helps us understand because we know AOD does depend on strength of selection exactly where this should tra trade off and why. Uh, and so this AOD leading to an increase in diversity is most likely, again, for intermediate selection and lower combination rates. So that's why we saw this, this light blue line in our previous result being the most strongly um, increasing in this scenario for associative overdominance. Um, okay, and so, um, yeah, so, so moving forward, we wanted to see uh, the general motivation for this was, is this actually an important process? So now we know that the process can happen and what scenarios we expect it to happen, but is it ever going to be observable um, in natural situations in, in the real biological world? And so to try to um, think of a way where we could eventually um, understand this in, in any organism that has been sampled gen genetically, um, we looked at the site frequency spectrum. Um, and so this is actually a normalized site frequency spectrum. And the site frequency spectrum, or SFS for short, is showing you how frequent mutations are of a I mean, many um, individuals would have only one mutation at this site. Um, and so that would be the, the class of one. Frequent are they in the population? Um, and so here we're going from patients at zero and only showing up to 150 out of this sample size. And this is standardized or normalized to the deviation uh, from the expected frequency in a neutrally evolving population. So everything that um, is at this dashed gray line would be perfectly what we expect if there were, was full neutrality, no selection going on at all, no AOD or anything. Um, but what we do see, so this is one of our cases of intermediate strength of selection, S is 10 to the minus three. Um, this was that yellow line we saw in the earlier plots that was um, behaving in the most intermediate manner. Um, and we have this for three different cases of dominance. Um, so H equals a half is fully additive and H equals zero is fully recessive. And then there's partially recessive. And the fully recessive case was the one where we saw the strongest associative overdominance. Um, and that is actually really strongly reflected here in the site frequency spectrum. So the, the black and tan lines are pretty flat, not doing too much different from expectation. Um, but this fully recessive line, this blue one, has a huge peak here on the left. And so this is showing that there's a lot of diversity for sites, um, yeah, for sites around a frequency of 25 most of the time, getting closer to zero on this end or up to 50. Um, but this means that it's picking up on this fact that there's a lot of heterozygosity being maintained by AOD um, when we have fully recessive mutations. And so 
this site frequency spectrum was then a good way that we could try to look and see is AOD identifiable in populations. Um, and we could again, using still just the simulations, look at our simulations of different strengths of selection, going from really weak at the top here up to really strong at the bottom. And we can again recapitulate or see again the, um, the results we found earlier of where we expect AOD to happen. Um, so in our really weakest case, we don't see too much difference. There's like a bit of a peak out here, but it's it's a really broad one. So there's um, maybe some heterozygosity, but it's spread across many different classes. Um, and if we look at our strongest class, we really see nothing of interest. Everything, maybe there's a few of uh, class zero or one, but that's not indicative of AOD. We have no AOD going on here because mutations were too strong of an effect on fitness. Um, and so, yeah, selection was too strong in this case. Here we can have weak selection, so there might be a lot of frequent heterozygotes of different uh, frequency classes. Um, but the ones where we can most easily pick up on AOD are these ones here, where we um, both this blue and this tan yellowy brown peak, um, and the tan one disappears a bit. But this blue one is quite strong, and we see these peaks of heterozygosity in these middle to lower frequency classes. And as selection's getting stronger, so from 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus three to 10 to the minus two, this peak is actually shifting to the left. So here it's kind of centered maybe at 45, here certainly more at 25, here maybe even closer to 10. And so it's, it's not only becoming narrower, but it's also moving, um, it's becoming narrower and moving to the left. And so we're getting this difference that we could see, um, that we could understand before between our difference in uh, synonymous diversity, this pi s and this derived allele frequency. Um, this explains perfectly what's going on. It's a low frequency sites, or there's still a lot of heterozygosity, but it's spread across many different sites of different frequency. Um, and so these are all cases where we see AOD. This was great. So then we could take the SFSs um, and use those to detect AOD perhaps in real organisms. Um, and so at this point, uh, my other co-author, Fanny Pouillet, um, who's now working in Paris, um, uh, she does a lot more empirical genomics and has done this work in human genomics before, um, took human genomic data from the Thousand Genomes Project and uh, looked again to see if we could understand or find sites where AOD might be going on and driving diversity in humans. And so this was still quite preliminary. Hopefully we'll be able to do more in this direction in the future to understand a bit better and with larger sample sizes. But this was sort of our first look uh, in investigating the diversity um, changes that might be due to AOD across the human genome. And so what Fanny did was a sliding window scan um, going across the human genome in different little windows um, that move each time you look at a different one. Um, and she looked for regions where we have higher than expected heterozygosity in low recombination. And so what that meant um, was she would go through a region um, and find using a linkage map that had come from previous work saying what the recombination rate should be in these sites. Um, do we have higher or lower diversity in our higher and lower recombination rate regions. Um, it's a bit complicated. Maybe it will make more sense when I show the fi figure. But she identified 22 candidate regions where there could be AOD driving diversity in humans. Um, but the caveat here, it's really difficult to distinguish this from classic, what I'll call classic balancing selection. Um, that could be a semantic argument, but I'll, I'll explain what I mean uh, in the next slide here. So these, these are three candidate regions that Fanny found for AOD shown by these gray um, bars that are circled in these um, black dashed lines. There's actually a fourth one here, but we're not talking about it in the results on the right. Um, and so these are different chromosomes in humans. And this is this difference in diversity between a uh, high and low recombination rate, this difference in pi. Um, and so basically every time we see a peak um, above this dashed line, we're seeing higher than expected diversity uh, for pi. And so those peaks are what are leading us to pick up on these certain uh, regions of the chromosome as these outlier regions. Um, and when I mentioned before that it's really difficult to distinguish from classic balancing selection, um, I mean like a scenario where you have a beneficial result from being heterozygous in a different way than saying, it's better to be heterozygous because we don't have bad things expressed. In this case, it's better to be heterozygous because then better things are expressed. And so this is a, a well-known result of, of the MHC locus in humans where we know there's a lot of diversity because uh, there's uh, different phenotypes produced that are 
um, maintained as um, as heterozygous in the population. I won't go too much into it, but it's quite an interesting thing if you guys don't know the example of MHC. Um, but basically we couldn't tell this site apart that we know is due to balancing selection from sites that we think might be due to AOD. So these other ones we think are good candidates for AOD. And we looked at this site frequency spectrum again, normalized, and it's quite noisy because we have quite small sample sizes. So some of these are only very few loci in these regions of low recombination. But we see things that at least don't, um, don't disprove what we're thinking is going on. So there are peaks of heterozygosity um, at different uh, frequency classes that would be indicative of the process of AOD, given what we know from our simulations. Um, and so, so this was really cool. So we think it could be something that is going on in, in the human genome um, and that there could be some important um, downstream uh, take homes that are uh, useful for biologists going forward. And I I think that's my next slide. I have one more summary. So we, yeah, so we can find signatures of this AOD in human genomes, but it's really worth in the future um, investigating this a bit more. So hopefully we'll be able to do that um, and have a better answer for how much of the human genome might actually be impacted by um, associative overdominance. Um, but so the important things I think to understand or take home from this talk um, is that we did find that AOD can have large impacts on diversity in regions of liver combination. Um, and if this is the case, if it's much more of a prevalent uh, process than we may have thought years ago, um, it could be something that confounds scans for balancing selection um, in terms of saying, oh, this is due to recessive deleterious mutations instead of beneficial heterozygous sites. Um, it could potentially interfere with FST outlier scans when looking for locally adaptive sites. So we could see peaks of diversity that are due to AOD rather than um, peaks of differentiation due to uh, locally adapted, um, due to local selection that select for different um, differences between populations. Um, but really what we still need to understand is uh, how prevalent this process is. And it will depend on a lot of different things in, in the real world, in nature. But so potentially this could also help us understand some of these questions that we have about how biology proceeds in the natural world. So what kinds of recombination patterns are most likely? Sure, in humans, we have quite good recombination maps, but there's many species that we don't have this. And it's quite difficult to, to make a recombination map that takes a lot of, um, a lot of data to do such a thing. Um, we also don't really know how recessive mutations are in, in nature. Um, this could be something that differs by population, it could differ by species, or maybe by family or genera, or maybe it's similar across everything. Um, but we really don't know if many deleterious mutations are super recessive or, or somewhere in the middle. We have a general idea it's probably something intermediate. Um, but that's still a, a kind of open question in, in evolution and in science. Um, we also don't really know what the strength of selection is on average. So. Um, a lot of work is being done these days on what the distribution of fitness effects is for new mutations. Um, maybe some people have heard the term DFE, that's this distribution of fitness effects. And we try to understand um, for any population or species or what have you, um, if a new mutation occurs, is it more likely to be really, really deleterious or is it more likely to be intermediate or is it more likely to be really weak? Um, we don't really know, but maybe most mutations are quite weak. Um, but it's quite important to understand out of the ones that are more intermediate or more strong, how frequently are they occurring? Because that again is what determines whether AOD is happening or not. So maybe if we can identify AOD, we can then somehow uh, feed back into understanding, oh, well, we saw the signature of AOD. So that must mean we have at least some intermediate strength mutations going on. Um, okay, so I hope hopefully that made some sense. I have to thank quite a few people. So my co-authors on this paper, the paper is here if you want to find it on current biology, uh, Fanny Pouillet, Laurent Escoffier, and Stefan Peichel. And then everyone from my lab in Bern who talked to me or helped, <clears throat> helped with um, some thoughts on the project at one time or another. Um, Brian Charlesworth in Edinburgh actually talked to us quite a bit about associative overdominance when we were starting this project. And Vitor Sousa in um, Lisbon, um, is also doing some very interesting work in AOD and talked to us also quite a bit about this. Um, and then I had uh, several funding sources. Um, and I think with that, I'm done and happy to take any questions. And now I need to figure out how to open this chat screen again. Uh, thank you guys for listening. <laughs> mm, okay. Thank you very much uh, to present here. Uh, I can hear you, this is great. <laughs> 
How do I open the chat oh, window? Cool. Do you know? Uh, actually, uh, you're supposed to see uh, at the right hand side box. Uh, enable chat panel. Okay. Hmm. Okay, well, maybe if you can read any questions that come up, because I don't seem to be successfully getting it. Uh, I closed it and I didn't think, I thought I would be able to get it back, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have any questions? Uh, you can type in the chat section. Or if I need to repeat anything, if it was unclear, I'm also happy um, to do so. Or if not, if there is no questions, I, I hope you guys at least learned something new. Maybe you'll hear more about uh, AOD in the future. We'll see if it does turn out to be a an important thing or not. Hopefully more genomic data will help us um, understand it a bit better. <laughs> I think uh, no one has any questions. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to present here again. And I hope uh, we can find a chance to hear your another presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me. And thank you guys for listening. Um, have a nice rest of the day. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Okay. Bye. <laughs>